so many fleeces, so little time. <laughs> the stairs. <laughs> Hi friends, how are you today? Today is uh, Monday, the 13th of July, 2020, and this is my channel, Soulful Spinning, about creating and using hand spun yarn. So how's everybody today? I hope you're doing well wherever you are and you're healthy and safe. So I wanted to put out a quick video. Uh, that's what I always say, and then it's an hour later, but I wanna put a quick uh, video out um, just to say hi and tell you what I've been up to. So last night, right before I went to bed, I saw that I had uh, 2,000 subscribers. 2,000 subscribers, I cannot believe it. So if you're one of my new subscribers, thank you so much for uh, subscribing. I really appreciate it and I love your comments. I have heard from so many people and um, it just really touches me and touches my heart that I feel like the way I feel about yarn and fiber and fleeces and making is shared by so many and so many of us find solace and comfort in our crafts especially when times are hard so welcome welcome everyone so in today's episode i have a finished knit i have some fiber preparation to talk about a little bit more i've learned about shetlands and uh, a couple new fleeces I wanted to show you so so yeah so let's jump right in it just is there for for us <laughs> oh I always I always also wanted to talk about a book that really I think was the planted the seed in in me to w want to learn how to spin and learn about breed specific yarns and um, fiber so let's uh, talk Let's see. Oh, she just moved. <laughs> yeah. I think I'll talk about my finished spinning first and then um, some fiber prep talk. Uh, so too many, too many fleeces, too little time is this, this is the title of this episode. So, um, yeah, I'll get right into the content and then at the end we'll do a little chit chat about um, some other things too. So what did I finish this week? So last week I was talking about um, preparing a Moritz Shetland bat and I did, I had one, I had two one ounce bats and I spun up this skein of Moritz Shetland. Here's the lock. This is a, <clears throat> this is one of those 1927 fine Shetland fleeces. Um, 
very next to skin soft, very, very tight crimp, which, um, which gives it a very nice elastic, stretchy uh, characteristic. This has not been washed yet. I, I'm trying to get a few skeins together before I, um, before I do some finishing in the wash, just to save on the soaps and detergents. So yeah, so this is, you can see again, very, very stretchy. I have lot. I don't really have too much Shetland yet. I do. I'm planning a half shawl, so I have lots and lots of Shetland that I still have to prepare and spin to to make my project. But this is going to be one of the stripes, one of the contrast colors. I got plenty of this. I, I probably have enough for this for the main body of the shawl. But I'm going to go light with the shawl. I'm going to use. Um, I'm going to use this fleece here. This is this is Emma from Soft Shetland Wool on Etsy. Uh, Jen Johnson, her one of her uh, sheep, I bought this fleece uh, some years ago now, and I've been combing this up into these little nests, and I'm going to spun it, spin it, uh, long draw, um, but with all the fibers in the same direction, so it'll be slightly um, semi semi woolen then. So I think this is going to be the main uh, part of the shawl. So. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about it. Uh, speaking of Jen, um, Jen's channel, which is called, um, I'll link her, sh her uh, channel below. Uh, sh she just started a new series called The Good of Work, which I totally love that title. And she brings you on her farm. You know, she shows how she's preparing um, the bottles for her bottle fed lambs. She goes out and feeds them. Um, she talks about the chores on the farm, and then she, she takes you into her wool cave and, and shows us how she's preparing her fine Shetland wool for spinning and for fiber bats. And uh, I just really was thoroughly delightful, and I'm looking forward to a lot more episodes from you, Jen. So I hope to see a lot more of you here on YouTube. So yeah, check her out. She's got a shop on Etsy, and her channel will be linked below. So let's see what else I have on my list here. So, so I've been doing a lot of fiber preparation. I've been, I've been doing a lot of combing, a lot of combing. So I, I combed. This is a one ounce of Emma, and then I've got another ounce over here. So I'm weighing it out. Uh oh, I'm weighing it out, and I'm going to do one ounce bobbins. So then when I spin them together, it'll be a two ounce skein. So I, I've done two ounces of combs, uh, combed nests of the Emma. And then this lovely here, whoopsie, a little pen stuck there. And this is Lakshmi, uh, which is a soft Shetland fleece from Jen Johnson. And I am, I am using my mini combs so I'm preparing these tiny little nests here, and it's a soft pale gray. Lakshmi also has some darker shades in her fleece, um, but I'm just pulling out the pale shades and uh, combing. So again, I'm going to spin this up, long draw on my wheel, so it'll be a semi-woolen yarn. So, so I talked about why uh, this is, I've been talking about Shetland for the last several episodes because Shetland is so different. Depending on where you buy your Shetland and what the breeder is breeding for, you're going to get a wide variety of Shetlands. So this is definitely in the fine category. It's I think it's 23 microns. She she gets all of her fleeces tested. Um, so 23 microns, right in the fine range. So you know just as fine as a merino or or a fine Coradale. Coradale is the same way. You can get really fine Coradale and more coarser, or you know, I don't like to use the word coarse because it's really, uh, it's not very descriptive, you know. But in terms of the what most people to be perceived to be soft. So um, I'm just finding that combing is actually a little faster than flick carding, and then drum carding the locks. So that's my plan, is I'm just going to go ahead and comb. 
until I get enough uh, yarn for my half. I think I'm going to need about 450 grams of uh, Shetland wool for my half shawl. So probably two or three times as much for the main color and the border, which will be the same color as the other colors. So um, that'll be a work in progress. Hopefully by next spring I might have a half shawl. So that's pretty exciting. And uh, yeah, I've been loving, uh, you know, there's that expression, diving deep. I have taken the dive deep into the Shetland breed. So that is my fiber prep. What else have I been combing? I've been combing a lot. Um, I find that when I comb fiber, it's <clears throat> very, very therapeutic. You know, you lash on your locks and then you basically make it into this perfect preparation for spinning and you just get in the zone and it's just very relaxing and then you have these beauties to show for, for your efforts. So, so these two nests are from a Romney fleece uh, that I bought this summer called Scarlet. And I'm spinning, uh, I wanted a break from my Shetland so I started to comb some more nests for, for this fleece. It's very soft. This is a yearling fleece, Romney, and it's it's quite soft. Um, not not as soft as a fine uh, merino or the fine Shetland, but it is pretty. It's pretty darn soft. So let me show you my bobbin that I've spun so far. And I'll go upstairs in a little while and um, film myself spinning. Sorry about the air conditioning, guys. It's uh, you know summer in Chicago, so um, just went off, thankfully. So this is my bobbin, and I'll go upstairs in a little while and do a little uh, B-roll of me spinning this. So I wanted to show you how I am spinning this. This is my first bobbin uh, of Romney, uh, Romney Yearling U, um, that I hand combed. And these are what the nests look like. I've got four pretty big substantial ones here. And there's nothing like your own hand combed top for breezy and easy spinning. Here are what my samples look like. And so what I'm doing is I'm doing a short, well, a modified forward, short forward draw. I've got a new bobbin on my Lendrum here, my Lendrum Double Treadle, which is really kind of your go-to. In the world of wheels, this is your Toyota or Honda. You know, they just, they work all the time. They never give you any trouble. Very nice wheel. Very easy to thread. So, so I've got my lace flyer. So this is um, 12, 15, and 17 to 1. So I'm spinning this on a 17 to 1 ratio. Get it started going in a clockwise direction. I've got my leader looped here. And I stick my fiber inside the loop. So this is your short forward. This would be your classic short forward and smooth, otherwise known as inchworm. But because this is a longer staple fiber, you can draft out. You can keep your hands fairly far apart. So no. So that's your short forward draw. And what I'm doing is I am doing a couple of draws forward. So kind of a modified, so I'm letting twist into the fiber supply here. So with true worsted, you never let the twist, you pull out and you smooth, pull out, smooth. 
But what I'm doing is I'm just kind of keeping my fiber hand stationary and pulling out two, two lengths of fiber pretty much, two staple lengths. This is as close to true worsted as I ever get. I do think that short forward draw is better for longer stapled fibers. I think for short stapled fibers, woolen's the way to go. Otherwise, you're 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 doing an inch at a time. It can get very tedious for me, anyways. But I'm kind of an impatient person, so. And there's my. There's my sing, uh, single double backed on itself. So, yeah, I'm getting a DK to light worsted yarn. And I'm getting a nice plied structure, and but still having retaining some of the loft. So, I'm getting about 18 wraps per inch, which when you two ply is giving me. A finished yarn of about 12, 12 wraps per inch. Peaches does a pretty good job of blending in, don't you? You blend right into your little sheepy. Doing a modified short forward draw, uh, letting some letting some twists between my hands, but I'm basically forward draw, and I'm getting a really really nice single. So can't really see that there. Here's a little here's a couple of ply back samples for this guy here. So nice and it's a long long wool. So I'm gonna when I ply it, I'm gonna ply it loosely like this. Yes, yeah, really, really nice. It's so easy to pre prepare and so easy to spin. So I've got to keep things separated here. So that's that. And I'll put this over here. And what else?
All right, so last week I talked about um, maybe getting some more Shetland, and indeed I did. So I was looking on Etsy for Shetland providers. I just don't want to get a variety of, of types. And um, yeah, I got my hair, I got my hair cut. It's nice for the summer. So I got my hair cut last week. Um, it's really nice. Um, so, so I went on Etsy and I found this shop. This is Eureka Farm. And here's her card. It's Donna. Uh, our 30-acre farm in northern Baltimore County, Maryland, is the home to our flock of 44 Shetlands raised only for their lovely wool fleece. We work extremely hard to maintain a healthy flock and provide fleeces free of excessive VM and worthy of your designs. We offer heavily skirted raw fleeces and roving in a variety of beautiful natural colors in this heritage breed. We hope to look we hope you look to Eureka Farm as your source of quality Shetland wool. So their flock is 2092 the North American Shetland Sheep Association and they sell at fiber festivals from New York to Virginia. So I bought a fleece, his, um, his name is Gunter, and Gunter it was, had a prize-winning fleece at the New York Sheep and Wool Festival in 2019. I'll be right back. Yeah, so what I think is happening is because the fiber festival, festivals have all been canceled, there's a lot more fleeces available for people to buy online. So I suspect that's what happened with this breeder because she just opened her shop in 2020, like just like a couple months ago. So I'm just assuming that she's just trying to sell um, her fleeces that would normally sell, you know, at Maryland Sheep and Wool or New York, all the different festivals. So I was kind of excited because I don't, I mean, my, the probability of me getting to one of those festivals is, is pretty, pretty small at this, this point. So I felt really um, kind of lucky that I, I, I bought a couple of fleeces from her. So I bought Gunter, and here, here's a picture of Gunter in the little pamphlet here. She said this was his runway picture. <laughs> and um, she described uh, Gunter as a silvery gray with brown shading. And let me show you some of the clean locks from Gunter. Okay, so this is this is some of the clean fleece. This is from around the neck and the shoulder area. So I, I did lay out the fleece. It was rolled perfectly. It, it opened up just perfectly. Uh, I separated the bridge wool into a separate pile, and then I took like the front and the sides, and then I took the center. I sort of separated it into the different parts of the animal. I have to say, though, he's pretty consistently soft across the fleece, except at the bridge area, which was quite coarse at the end. But, um, yeah, this is the fleece. It's got blonde, blonde tips. And um, it's like a taupey silver. That's Most of the shades are this color. It's so pretty. I washed it in kookaburra, and then I, I rinsed it. My final rinse, I used kookaburra wash, which gives it a nice, soft conditioning treatment. Isn't that pretty? Very, very soft um, and very silky feeling. Yeah. So let me show you what I've done so far. Oh, oh I wanted to mention, there's basic, um, he's basically two colors. He's kind of, mostly he's this color, um, but then you get some, let's see if I can find one of the other locks, but some of it is, some of it is a little darker. And uh, so I'm going to probably, and th this, these locks were a little bit shorter than the others, so it's a little bit darker. What I've been doing is combing him because he does have a longer staple length. So this is one of the nests here. It's like liquid gold. 
And here's another one. You see, this is what you get when you comb. It's just so beautiful. And then here's one that's, a, I think you can see this, the shade differential. So this is just a little bit darker. Yes, yeah, so this is the darker shade, but mostly, ma mainly these beautiful silvery taupe colors. So pretty. So when I first got the fleece, I right away washed some up. These were my sample locks. See the nice, the wave, it's silky feeling. Whereas like Jen's fleeces, the 1927 fleeces are very cottony feeling and a lot, very squishy and very elastic. Uh, this, these are a little bit more wavy and silkier feeling. And then I, what I did is I took a couple of comb nests and I spun them up on my Lendrum. And then I just plied it right away. And this is what I came up with so far. This, I don't think this is going to change very much in the washing because I'm spinning it uh, semi-worsted here, or I don't know, semi-woolen. I, I, the way I have decided to categorize yarn is if all the fibers are going in one direction, it's going to be a semi-worsted. And if the fibers are jumbled up like a roll egg, then it's going to be woolen. It seems to me that that's the main driver between uh, how the yarn's going to turn out, but Woolen versus worsted is a hotly debated topic and you get lots of different interpretations. So I have a hard time distinguishing this. I would say this is semi-worsted with some of the twist, um, allowing some of the twist between my hands. It's very pretty. And there's my... And then this was one, a little sample I did uh, in more of a woolen style. And you can see it's a lot more fuzzy. So I think because he's a silky style, I'm going to, I'm going to spin it like this. And this is a, this is a DK to worsted. This is another part of, of, of Gunter. This is the center back and sides. And I just wanted to show you how clean this is. Uh, this is was not a coated fleece, but you can see how well skirted it is. Um, there were no, um, I mean, there's really no, like, really no veg matter to speak of. Very, very clean. Uh, it just speaks to, um, I don't know, the pasture or how they uh, keep this fleece so clean but this is Gunter unwashed. So I just wanted to get, um, I just wanted to get a little video here before I put him in for the cold soak. And look at all those little curls. I mean, who could resist? He's a beautiful boy. I don't know, he's a ram, and I know some people say ram fleeces can be a little bit uh, stinky. But this sells just as sweet as any used fleece, and this is sitting on my sitting on my washing machine here. So I'm going to stick all this. This is a large part of the fleece. I'm sure it's over, well over a pound. I'm going to stick it in my soccer ball bag and give it a nice cold soak, uh, maybe overnight, and then tomorrow I'll give it its scour. So I thought you'd I have get a kick out of looking at, what, uh, see what the fleece looked like before it was washed. So yeah, not coated, but absolutely beautiful. This is the the butt ends here and then if you flip it over you can see all the beautiful curls some of the locks some of the locks are shorter and uh, kind of a bold crimp and then these locks are a little bit longer yeah he's a really really beautiful boy Gunter. Gunter. So many fleeces, so little time. So, um, yeah, so while I was looking in, uh, I had already purchased Gunter 
And I, I paid a little bit extra for two-day priority shipping because shipping is just, shipping is, we live by an airport, so. <laughs> shipping has been so slow here in the States. Um, I mean, things that normally would have taken three to five days are taking three to five weeks. It's just ridiculous. So I paid a little extra for shipping, but um, I got it in just two or three days, so which was exciting. So after I had purchased uh, Gunter, I was looking and she posted another fleece, and this fleece's name was Quinn. And Quinn is a charcoal steely gray color. Let me show you some of his fleece here. Okay. So this is Quinn. And Quinn is a frosty, frosty gray. I think frosted black is considered Shayla in the Shetland Rainbow. And I think that's what this is. I think this is would be considered Shayla. And look at it. Look at the color. It's so, so beautiful. And this one, this one was really, really uh, very heavy in lanolin. I mean, they're very, very fresh fleeces. So he's mostly, whoopsie. This is always my favorite part of the podcast when I get to show you my fiber. He's mostly that frosted black color, but then you've got some very little uh, light gray shades. So, so pretty. They're pretty. I think the color's showing up really nicely here. So, yeah. I mean, I know. I know, look at it. Isn't that pretty? So what I did is I spun some, I, I car, uh, combed some up. So this is what the nest is, lo nest is looking like. And then I was so anxious to see what it would look like knitted. I, t I took a sample and I, I spun up like a little tiny bit of yarn here. And then I knit this swatch. So look, beautiful, beautiful steely gray. Let me see if I get you a better look here. So yes, so this actually uh, reminds me more of a Romney than a Shetland, you know, in terms of its luster. I mean, they say that Shetlands don't have that much luster, but this, this has a lot of luster. And this is what Quinn looks like unwashed. So this is, uh, Very nice and soft, uh, fresh lanolin. I just wanted to show you how clean her fleeces are. So uh, sh she does have, I think her name's Donna. She does have more fleeces on her web in her web shop on Etsy. So uh, if you're interested in getting a, a more medium type of Shetland, I highly recommend uh, her shop. She was really nice. She answered some of my questions and. Um, was really really nice and um, yeah I sometimes I'm loath to give out my sources because um, but I just want to share um, uh, just to promote somebody that's really doing such a spectacular job so I'll leave her link um, below in the description box I think that this type of Shetland is really what they refer to when you when someone says Shetland's easy to spin. This would be the type of fleece I would recommend to a new person. Um, yeah, it's very nice. I think this will make a spectacular sweater. I just, it's just, I mean, you guys look. How can this be? How can this be the same breed? This, 
and this I mean it doesn't even seem like it could possibly be the same breed so but I have found um, there's my stairs over there <laughs> so I had found though an article Oh, um, I had found an article on the NASSA website, and uh, under the under the document section, there is a couple of really, really fascinating articles, and I guess you just really have to search for it. But if you go to the website, and I'll be I'll post a picture here, and if you go. Um, if you go to resources and documents, there's two articles. Um, one of them is the need to conserve different types of Shetland sheep, which was a talk that uh, the PhD gave on uh, in July of '93. And then there's the Sheep of Shetland: A Historical Perspective, which reads to me like a a thriller movie <laughs> because it's George Benedict's synthesis of published published references to Shetland sheep in the 18th and 19th centuries. And what I thought was cool is he has this first, uh, you know, I'm a math teacher, so I love flow charts. <laughs> he has this picture here. And he says the primitive Shetlands over here and the classic, which is like the fine, really super fine Shetland fleeces that like Jen raises. And then the modern Shetland, which is kind of a single coated, but more of a wavy, higher micron count so there's the three types and he goes through all the correspondence between um, uh, these two men you know the, I think I talked last week how they the, um, they, the, the, the the king wanted something that would be competitive with Spanish Merino because they couldn't get the Merinos out of Spain so they were looking all over the, you know, Britain to find uh, one that would be, you know, comparable. And so I highly recommend you read this. It, it's so, so interesting. And um, I think he kind of explains how the modern commercial Shetland is different than, than some of the other super fine fleeces. So I finished a knit this week. Um, this is a shawl. This is not out of hand spun. This is the, let's see, I'll show you what the pattern is. This is called Debut. And it's a free pattern on Ravelry. And I knit this out of a gift yarn from a, from a viewer. And uh, I think within the week that I received it, I had to cast it on because I thought it was just so, so pretty. So the yarn is Field of Dreams. And it's 50% uh, Polworth, 30% linen, and 20% Surrey alpaca. So I had four 50 gram skeins. So the shawl starts here. It's one of these boomerang shawls. And then it has some lace sections, basically yarn overs, knit two together. And I just kind of played with the colors. I didn't follow uh, the patterns exactly. I striped it. Now, this piece right here, I did a Pico bind off. And what happened is, is I ran out of yarn. Uh, I, I tried to bind off in the gold this yarn here but I didn't have enough so I went in my stash and I found uh, this I have two skeins skeins of this and uh, I have two others in, a, in another color and this pretty much is a perfect match for the gold this is by Scassell and it is called let me see Simply Natural by Haiku. And it is 40% al baby alpaca, 40% fine merino wool, and 20% mulberry silk. 
So I thought that the fiber content was very similar. It's a little thicker, but, and I, I wasn't really sure if it looks like a vastly different yarn, uh, but I kind of like it. It's a little bit heavier yarn, and I think it gives kind of a nice, uh, a nice touch to the shawl. You know, this, I'm not sure exactly how to wear um, this type of shawl. So it's got this long skinny piece here, which does make it nice to sort of tuck in. So yeah, I'm going to, um, I'm gonna enjoy this. Um, it's, it's very, um, the linen content and the, and the silk just gives it a nice kind of crisp hand really really nice so I was excited that I finished something it hasn't been blocked yet but but really I think because of the fiber content I think it just kind of opened up naturally so what I'm gonna do is wear it like this so I'll put this part in the front to show off that those picos and then just tuck this under yeah and just wear it like that so I'll finish that. I was I was happy about that. If you've been following me for a while, you know I'm kind of uh, have a hard time sticking with one project or one fleece. <laughs> but it's all good. It's my hobby. It's not my job. So uh, I find that when I put pressure on myself to get things done, you know, either for the podcast or whatever, you know, I start to feel like like it's a chore, and it's really a hobby. So. You know, do what makes you happy, right? And uh, But I would be happier if I had some more um, finished objects to show for my efforts. This is a wraps per inch tool by Sukuploki. And I'm, luckily I did get this before basically Europe was shut down to the United States. <laughs> I did get this in a reasonable amount of time. But it's wraps per inch. And I'm trying to um, learn more about um, how your single is related to your plied structure. So the general rule of thumb is that if you take your single and you multiply it by two thirds, that'll be your two ply weight approximately. So if you were going to do, let's say you, you were going to do, you know, 18 wraps per inch. If you multiply that by two thirds, uh, that would give you a 12 wraps per inch two ply yarn. So that's for two ply. And then I think for three ply, it's approximately double. And then of course you just go the opposite. So let's say you wanted, if you wanted a yarn to be 10 wraps per inch, you could multiply it by three halves and aim for a 15, um, wraps per inch single. I um, mean, of course, there's a lot of variation depending on your fiber and your spinning style and then what you do to finish because very springy yarns like Superfine Shetland or tar Targi or one of the down wools, they'll <clears throat> really spring up quite a bit. And so your finished yarn might be a lot thicker than you think. So that's why it's important to sample. Uh, that being said, I, I still have a hard time when I lay my singles along this. I have a hard time figuring out which one it is because some of them are so, so close. But um, I am I, I'm trying to get a little bit more precise in my um, measurements because when you want to do a big project, you want to have some consistency. So that's what I'm working on with my um, half shawl spin. So that's a wraps per inch tool. And then, um, yeah, so then the last thing I wanted to talk about is a book. And I, because I was thinking about this, I was thinking about how did I get interested in different breeds? You know, what, what spurred me? And I have an answer. It's this book right here. This is Clara Park's uh, book of, book of wool, Knitter's Book of Wool. This is our library copy, which, <laughs> I have to say, I think I'm the only one that's ever checked it out because it's still like pristine. <laughs> but, um, and you really can't find the hard copy of this book anywhere. I mean, you can get used copies, but they're really super expensive. But um, 
this is the ultimate guide to understanding using and loving this most fabulous fiber. And I remember opening this book and like just being you know, like, oh my gosh, this whole world is opening up to me. So she talks about um, what is wool and then she talks about the softness myth, you know, how everybody wants the soft yarn. Uh, and she talks about different breed categories. Of course, she classifies Shetland as dual coated primitive, which as we know, that's not necessarily the case, but we'll forgive her for that. <laughs> um, she talks about fine wools, medium wools, down and down type wools, long wools, dual coated and primitives. And I remember reading about Clun Forest and, and uh, you know, uh, Rambouillet and, and Columbia. And, and, I, and then I started looking for yarns that were specific, breed specific. And they're really hard to find. Um, I mean, there's more now than there was, you know, probably five years ago. But, um, you know, I started getting really interested in the different breeds and how do you get a hold of these different breed, breeds of, of sheep. I think that's what really spurred me to want to prepare my own fiber and uh, spin. It's a really, it's a really light, nice book. I really don't want to give it back to the library, but I know I have to. <laughs> but you can get an e-copy, I think, for ten dollars or something, which actually might be kind of nice because it has, um, it has patterns. So here's the Clun Forest. So each, I'll show you this section here. So this is Clun Forest, and then she gives you information about the breed, some samples, and she just goes through uh, different types. And then she also shows the locks. I think this is what got me, you know, looking at these locks in this book. And then she's got patterns that are, you know, four specific uh, breeds. Yeah, she's got the sweet fern mitts in here. So, have you read this one? It's it's uh, it's got a beautiful shawl pattern. This is out of Icelandic. And then actually, there's a pattern in here for a cardigan. The Allegan cardigan. Allegan, Michigan, is where the Michigan Fiber Festival is. And here's this cardigan. It's made with a broken rib pattern. And I actually have enough of this yarn that I bought from Marhaven, Mule Spun Marhaven yarn. And so Mule Spun, it mimics the, the movements of, of the hands when someone's spinning woolen. So I actually have this in my stash. I have the yarn to make this cardigan. Marhaven Wool Farm. She raised Merino Rambouillet cross sheep for decades. And she doesn't, um, I don't think she produces yarn anymore. But I met the lady um, once when we went to the Michigan Fiber Festival. We stopped at her shop, her farm shop, and I, buy, I bought some more in some different colors. But yeah, I think that this, this was the book that kind of really uh, spurred my interest in learning about breed-specific wool and then consequently my spinning journey. So I thought I would mention that. I think it's a worthy book to have in your library. And uh, if I can find a used copy, I may end up having to pick this up sometime. So that's about all the making I've been doing this week. Uh, you know, I feel like I don't have a lot to show for it, but I am looking at a desk full of combed top, a uh, hand, hand comb top. So. I, I it, you know, you have to embrace the slow when you're a knitter, a spinner. It's not something that, you know, it's it's not it's not a fast process, especially if you're if you're involved in lots of different things, you know. So this week marks kind of. I always feel like this is kind of marking sort of getting towards the end of my summer vacation. Uh, my husband and I are going to take the trip up north. We are going up to the UP of Michigan for a week. And we have a cabin up there. And we're going to stay up there and uh, take in the fresh air and do some fishing. And I'll bring my uh, crafting stuff. Now this is my problem is I, 
I want to bring all the things, you know, I want to, I, I want to bring all my things I want to cast to hunt. I want to bring all my fiber, all my tools. And really, the most I've ever spun up there is four ounces. That's it. So I think I'm going to bring my spindle projects um, that I showed, I think, last week or the week before. And I'll bring my spindle projects. And I'm thinking of bringing a little set of combs and maybe just, you know, a few ounces of locks in case I get the itch to... Uh, do some fiber preparation so uh, but yeah I don't bring a wheel or anything I mean it's just visiting with my sister and uh, you know taking in the fresh air and reading some books and taking walks and doing a little hiking but it's as much as I look forward to it I know that it's a, a marker because I come back and then I'm gearing up to get back to work and uh, School ended so abruptly last year in terms of our in-person teaching that I did not, you know, I don't really feel like I have everything ready. You know, usually I have things Xeroxed and things ready to go in my classroom. And, you know, we just had, we left, you know, in March, we just left. And so, and then it, it remains to be seen how we're going to start. I, I think we're in phase four in Illinois, so I think we're going to do some sort of hybrid I mean, we'll, I'll be teaching in class for sure. Um, and then maybe people, students that stay at home will, will watch it on TV or something um, over the internet. Uh, we have not really received any, um, too much information about that yet. But yeah, so keep me in your prayers, you guys. I, um, I always get a little anxious about going back to work just because, you know, it's, it's, it's different, uh, it's it's more stressful it's um, busier it's um, it's rewarding but it also has its challenges and you know I'm a couple years from retirement and um, I'll be 60 this year in the fall and I've got a couple more years and then I'll retire from teaching but I'm a little nervous about going back and teaching with a mask on I just don't know how it's gonna work but um, yeah, so it's a little it's a little bit anxiety provoking to tell you the truth, but but all shall be well. I I know um, I've been doing this for a long time, and I will rise to the challenge. But uh, I do wish things were different. So I think that's all I have for you today. So this will probably be my last cast until. Um, the end of the month and I hope you guys have a good rest of, the, of July and I hope you stay well and healthy and I look forward to talking to you when I get back from my vacation. So until then have a great day and we'll talk to you soon.